How are y'all doing? Tristan Sutton here, host of the Revenue Clinic podcast. Thank you for tuning in every Thursday at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, the purpose of this show is to help you cure your revenue ailments by bringing on experts and people at the top of their game to give you the tips and help you avoid those pitfalls in business and entrepreneurship to take it to the next level. So this week we have Mr. Kevin Riles, professor, um, Morehouse grad, um, alpha, all of the, you know, seven footer, Willow Ridge. <laughs> Um, he is a commercial real estate broker slash expert, and he's going to talk to you about everything you need to know about investing in commercial real estate, um, understanding your lease, um, everything you need to know as a business owner to make sure you can successfully navigate those commercial waters. So thank you for being on here today. Thank Kevin. you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Tell the good folks a little bit about yourself. I was born in 1973. <laughs> Long uh, walks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, man, I appreciate the uh, everything that you said was correct. I've uh, been owning... Uh, I've been in real estate since October of 1998, so just a little bit more than uh, wow. 20 years. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and my hair and uh, has, <laughs> you can see, uh, uh, being a business owner for that long. Uh, started off um, computer science, computer engineering mm -hmm. by trade, bought my first house. Hmm. And the guy that sold me that house was an engineer by day and a real estate agent by night. That's how it started. That's how I started. I never, when I left college, I never thought I would uh, yeah. uh, do this for a living. Ended up, uh, you know, liking it. Uh, left a uh, big, large oil company uh, to uh, to pursue it. Started off on the residential side for many years, and then about ten years ago, I started making the switch to commercial uh, mm. real estate. Uh, and so, um, been doing that ever since. And uh, you know, kind of have some specialties in certain areas of commercial real estate. But um, you know, and in fact, I do so much commercial now that I've actually changed the name of our company. Uh, in the last five years, to Kevin Ross Commercial, because everybody knows me, and then I want them to know what I what I yeah. do. Always be branding, ABB. Always, always be branding. <laughs> always be branding. Yeah. So tell us what made you, what was the click to go from residential to commercial? A um, couple things. One, um, I had um, one of the, my business philosophies just in general, regardless of the business, is that your niche will make you rich. Mm. Uh, so having a specialization uh, is something that I believe that you should have. I don't care if you're selling widgets mm. uh, or doing marketing or right. whatever the case may be. And so... Um, I had gotten a contract to list all the HUD foreclosures or FHA foreclosures for those that are not familiar with HUD in Houston. So as a part of that contract, I used to list like about 100 properties a month. Wow. Uh, and um, a lot of the investors that bought those properties while I had that contract um, wanted to start buying apartment complexes and mm. multifamily. Right. And so little by little, they would contact me, say, hey, I bought my first 10 foreclosures, you know, single families. I yeah. want to buy. An apartment complex and so representing those folks to buy those started me down the commercial route the other thing is gotcha. from a personal business standpoint and entrepreneurs will understand this residential real estate is a after hours weekend job gotcha uh, and i have a family <laughs> and commercial real estate for the most part people don't really bother you on the weekends gotcha. uh, and you can kind of get work done and so it's more of an eight to five business type of uh deal and i just suit where i am in my life right now Gotcha. And I hear the uh, the revenue is a little bit different on this side. Too. Just a little bit. Just yeah, a just little bit. A little bit. No. The bag is bigger. The bag, the bag is bigger. <laughs> and I'm still trying to secure the bag. Uh, but um, yeah, no, let me say this. It's the same level of work. Mm. There is a lot more knowledge uh, type work. And I say knowledge right. uh, in that, you know, calculations and things of that nature. But yeah, your average commercial transaction is going to be at least two to three zeros mm. more than, than your residential, unless you deal with like high end residential. Gotcha. So. Gotcha, gotcha. I mean, you heard it there. So the riches are in the niches. And if you can find an avenue to where your business, you're doing the same amount of work, but can add a couple more zeros to it. Absolutely. Take the extra effort to learn the skill set to do that because you have to have more knowledge, more certifications, things like that. Absolutely. No, I, the, I tell people all the time that um, I'm doing the same work, um, yeah. but and I work hard. I'm, I'm still at a you know, 60, 70 hour week uh, type of deal. But after 20 years, still this. Yeah, you know. I hear that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, you know, I mean, but I will say this: that's Monday through Friday instead of Monday necessarily through Sunday. Gotcha. Uh, and if you're in business, you're always kind of, to me, working as oh. far as thought is yeah. concerned. Yeah. But yeah, no. If, if the only way to increase your income in any business is to do more volume or do larger transactions, Absolutely. and so I chose to do larger transactions. Two ways to scale. Two ways to scale. Absolutely. So let's talk about. You know, we're going to jump into the leasing portion and things like that, mm -hmm. but then we're going to talk about the investment. So. As a business owner, when we're out there getting leases and things like that, what are some things we should be aware of? Okay. First thing is, and I'm going to sound biased, uh, <laughs> you should uh, get what's called a tenant rep 
uh, a tenant rep broker, tenant representation, uh, which is a broker that specializes in helping you find lease space. Um, uh, I've seen, I would say probably more than 70% of leases are people that just call the sign. Hmm. Uh, and in residential real estate, you can kind of fiddle your way through that right. uh, as a non-expert, but in commercial real estate, that is uh, not the way to go. But let's just say uh, that you did not uh, do that. Um, and uh, you kind of wondering what you should be looking out for. First and foremost, um, you should uh, be aware of what type of lease it is. Is hmm. it a full service lease? Gotcha. Uh, is it a what we call a uh, triple net lease or is it somewhere in between those things? Uh, gotcha. What we call a modified gross lease. Uh, so and that basically tells you whether your ancillary things like electricity and taxes and insurance are in the lease rate right. or they're separate from that. Right. Uh, so uh, it's mm -hmm. Very important to know. <laughs> <laughs> Uber important uh, to know, as many entrepreneurs find out after they've signed the lease. Right. Um, if you need um, improvements to the space, whether it be retail, office, or industrial, you need to understand tenant improvements mm -hmm. and uh, the cost of that and how that um, is, is worked out within the lease as well. Absolutely. Um, and then I would say you need to understand the default clause. Um, mm. If I had to pick three things in a, in yeah. a usually commercial leases are for oh, anywhere from 21 to you know, I've seen 100 page leases. If, if I had to highlight those three three things, the type of lease, um, type and duration of the lease, the type of um, uh, things that you need to know as far as the default clause, how do I get out of the lease mm -hmm. or can I get out of the lease gotcha. or what happens if I default? Exactly. Uh, and people don't know that that provision um, sometimes is is negotiable. Really, because some people don't realize that, you know, most businesses close within the first two to three years. That's correct. Eighty percent. And if you have a five year lease, you got two years left to pay. Yeah, exactly. And average, you know, front, you know, was it, uh, you know, what's the what's the strip center? It's like two, three thousand in Houston. Yeah. Alone, yeah. A month. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's and that's base rate, not even with triple on that. So right. what I would tell people is that usually in that scenario, if you close down before the end of the lease, um, the lease typically says that you uh, uh, are responsible for the next two year or whatever the, yeah. the lease, right? And you're personally responsible because most of them don't want a personal guarantee. Mm -hmm. And guess what? If you're not paying, it's not like in residential real estate where uh, I have to give you 30 days notice or three day notice and then evict you. Yeah. Commercial leases say I can lock you out. And yeah. if you don't pay, cure it. All this stuff in here, all these cameras and everything, yeah. They go in, they, I they, get to sell that. They to, confiscate your stuff. They confiscate, yeah. Lock. <laughs> All of us have been to a restaurant. Oh, I can't wait to eat. Walk up, I'm like, oh man, a little lead on the door. You ain't paid rent. Yeah. You have X amount of days to cure it. They put it out there yeah. for you. So it's a little more savage on the commercial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, some things that you need to know about your lease are what is not covered. So, example, I will give you um, your air conditioning unit for most times is not covered. Uh, one time we had in a storefront center, I had yes, triple net, least, yeah. triple net. Mm -hmm. um, the copper wire was stolen from the back of the building, which I don't own. Mm -hmm. It was not my part of the building, mm -hmm. um, but it cut off electricity to my office. The landlord said I had to pay sixteen hundred dollars to replace the wire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, um, that's a really good example. So yeah. in a triple net lease uh, or a what we call a net lease. Okay. Um, the landlord basically passes through all of their costs to the tenant mm -hmm. uh, and they separate um, uh, that. And so with that being said, the lease says that uh, once basically once you're in the space, yeah, everything inside the space is your responsibility and everything uh, on, on top and behind the space is your responsibility. Yeah. However, <laughs> you could have, for instance, uh, depending on you know when the lease started, negotiate that the landlord warrant those items for X amount of time. Mm. Uh, and they would have been responsible for that. Or you could have gotten, that's a really specific example, you right. could have gotten language to say, well, yeah, I'm responsible for my AC, um, but anything that pertains to electrical yeah. disruption, you're responsible for yeah. it. So, Again, that just comes. That's why I say, you know, I think people need to use an experienced tenant rep broker or, or a commercial that understands leasing. And even we are always constantly learning because that's a very specific scenario. Right, right, right. Um, but and nobody thinks about what's behind the building. <laughs> behind the building. Most people will think about the air conditioning yeah. unit. Um, but like I just negotiated a lease uh, for um, someone and I got them to warrant the air conditioning for the first year. Wow. Uh, so that if it breaks or anything like that then the landlord is responsible for it. Because let's be clear, this is not your uh, mama's air conditioning unit. When it no, comes no, to no, 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 it's not. No, no, two, sir. three, four thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when it's it fixed, not even. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, even so, in some of the retail spaces, 
you know, you're talking about uh, anywhere from seven to 10 tons. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, some rule of thumb is a thousand dollars a ton. Mm. So, so yeah, you're looking at college tuition. Right. So, so exactly. make sure you're aware of that. So this is all about making sure that you're aware of what you most likely will be responsible for. Um, so there are some covenants that you can get, you know, finessed in you there. Can. <laughs> and then the other thing I would say is brokers are responsible for rates in general terms, but I always recommend and most of my clients have taken me up on it, having a commercial real estate attorney yes. review uh, their leases. And yeah. if not, so if nothing else, if you don't use a broker, you should have an experienced commercial real estate yeah. attorney review your lease because the difference between an and and an or in a legal document can make a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. And so also something to be aware of is when you're we're just talking about storefront right now. But when you're in, let's say, an office building mm -hmm. um, and tenant in there, there's something I forget the phrase, but annual that they can assess every member for a fee to for improvements and things like that. What's that called? So so it depends on the type of lease again. Right. So so office buildings used to be what we call full service leases where okay. they baked everything into the rate. Yeah. There was nothing outside of the rate. They were not you, they're responsible for the air conditioning. Yep. They're responsible for electricity. But landlords have gotten gotten, I guess, a little smarter. and They want to be profitable. So now uh, uh, now um, office buildings are doing basically triple net lease. They're, they're carving out those things and they call that a CAM, mm. common area maintenance. Yeah. Uh, so um, they'll take out if, if they need to do renovation, then again, uh, in your lease, it'll define what is CAM, what's covered in CAM. Right. So do you then need to negotiate? Well, hey, if you want to do an upgrade, that's on you. I'm OK with what it is. I want to cross that provision. The landlord might say, well, no, we won't do that. But it's the it's knowing what that CAM is made up of. Right. And so landlords can put all kinds of stuff in that bucket because they want you to pay for everything. Absolutely. So. This part of the show is to, so you can learn from our mistakes and our experiences <laughs> so you don't have to. Um, I had I got hit with cam once, paid my monthly rent. All of a sudden I got this extra envelope that says, hey, um, we need, you know, fifteen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, you signed at least two, three years ago. You forget what's in there. So mm -hmm. call, you know, my and what you got hit with was at the end of every year yeah. they do a reconciliation. And if the cam is short globally, right. they divide that shortage by every exactly. tenant. Exactly. And if it's over, they can send you a check. Very seldomly do they no. go over, though. No. Uh, usually it's under. <laughs> so. so, yeah. So yeah. I got assessed $1,500 from the property owner to make sure that they can cover all the expenses and upgrades, um, like when the air condition goes out. So that is why as a business owner, it's important for you to have savings or access to credit because you never know when these unexpected expenses can come up. We're talking about within a five year period, $1,600 for some copper I didn't own, then $1,500 just for some overage. Yep. So business savings is, the, again, this is beyond the scope of the commercial real estate, but as a business owner for 20 years, uh, having a business savings account where you have to me six months worth of business expenses saved up is one of the most important things you can do as a business owner. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's transition from that because, you know, we get tired of landlords sometimes. <laughs> when is it best for a business to own their own property versus leasing? Yeah, I'm a big proponent of ownership just regardless. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about most large corporations, including uh, Facebook, including mm -hmm. um, Apple, including Exxon, yeah. the majority of their um, net worth as a business is is in the real estate that they own. Not not in the in that, not necessarily just the intellectual property. Kind of like uh, Ray Kroc with McDonald's, McDonald's. stores. Like you know, you're not in the burger business; you're in the land. Business. Like in the land business, he said that to the Harvard uh, staff in in the, in the late '70s, Harvard uh, MBA program. Uh, I'm not in the real, I'm, I'm not in the burger business. I'm in the real estate business, and that's why every McDonald's you see is typically in a hard corner and has a high sign. He started that, uh, and so but the value of McDonald's is not in the burger, uh, but in the uh, uh, in the real estate that they own. So I sell that to say uh, that I'm a big proponent of ownership, just like home ownership. Mm -hmm. There's pluses, obviously, right, and then there's right. minuses. I'm right. responsible for everything. Absolutely. I'm a big proponent, if you can, uh, uh, in multi-tenant property ownership. So and break that uh, down for them. So multi-tenant is, for instance, you mentioned that your um, insurance business is in a retail uh, space. So I would be a proponent of anyone that's in a retail space well why not buy the retail center mm -hmm. and have the the tenants subsidize or pay your mortgage and so everything that you make is is gravy uh, and so if you can do that that's great depends on your type of business yeah. i just bought an office condo for my business so office condo is office space um kind of like an office apartment complex exactly uh, for <laughs> lack of a better term and uh, i did that because i was paying basically you know the same amount of money 
afford my the, my current mortgage for one office in a executive suite. Uh, so it just made sense to me, uh, and I was just tired of you know paying that amount of money. So I, I would say uh, to build wealth, and and if you ever want to sell your business, mm -hmm. then uh, and sell your book of business, then selling the book is one thing. Um, um, but also the assets of the business make up the value of the business. And so if you want to increase the value of your business, then I think purchasing something is important. Absolutely. Assets are always valuable because now you have something in addition to um, your revenue, your team, things like that, if you ever want to sell off your business. And so it's always important to make sure that you understand the pros and cons, because, you know, that rent may be the same as that mortgage for owning that mm -hmm. building, but you also have to be responsible for the entire property, Earth. upkeep, yeah. <laughs> Earth, Earth. you know, yeah. um, compliance with the city ordinances, you know, all of that. So just be aware there's additional headaches with, with the benefits. And if well. it's a multi-tenant, you go, you know, you can get a management company, but at the end of the day, yeah. you're responsible uh, for them as well. But to build true wealth, right. And I don't care, again, if you sell widgets to marketing, to real estate, yeah. um, you know, asset ownership is important and increasing your asset base is important. Absolutely. So, I mean, think about, you know, Nipsey Hussle. He bought mm -hmm. the strip center that his clothing store was in mm -hmm. and rented out the, the peripheral stores. And he tells a story, you can find it, I think, on YouTube, where he used to, as a boy, go to the burger place. There's mm -hmm. a well-known burger place there. And uh, the guy would kind of, you know, not be the nicest to him. He said, it felt so good to go get a rent check from him after they <laughs> bought it. Uh, so that's why I love Nipsey. But Nipsey, you know, w was basically doing community and economic development and building wealth. So. Yeah. And so you can do the same. So start looking at how you can apply your savings and your investments into owning the building that you're in, that you're, that you're, where your business is. So speaking of investing, there's two main ways to make money from commercial real estate investments. Mm -hmm leasing mm -hmm. as well as the appreciation mm -hmm. you want to break those down or add to them um i would say that um i mean there are other uh, uh ways as well i guess i'll add first um, <laughs> um people flip commercial properties just like they flip houses mm. and people don't realize that so i have people that flip apartment complexes so in my business uh one of my largest silos of my business is what's called investment brokerage okay. anything that produces an income um, that an investor would buy to receive income. So hmm. investment brokerage is a silo of, of uh, probably more than 50% of what I do. Uh, and so a majority of that is apartment complexes, mm -hmm. uh, retail centers, uh, and then what we call single tenant buildings that, for instance, a state farm agency would be in, but they're leasing and gotcha. an investor buys that just to get uh, as a rental property. Gotcha. So uh, people do uh, commercial real estate flips Obviously, it takes a little bit more money because those are bigger transactions. Uh, um, but uh, that's one way. Uh, the other way is uh, syndicating deals. In other words, getting a group of people uh, uh, and raising money and going out and buying mm -hmm. uh, property as well. Uh, and so uh, you can make money that way, both on the purchase of it, but also the management of that, the management of the fund that buys that. Um, so to be honest with you, there's a myriad of ways that, yeah. you know, we could spend a whole podcast just on that. <laughs> but the, the two basic ways are buying something and leasing it out. Gotcha. Uh, and um, uh, the, the other way is, is purchasing something, renovating it yeah. uh, and, and flipping it. I like that um, community economics you mentioned where, what if some business owners here got together mm -hmm. and said, instead of spending money on going out and things like that, we'll put it in a pool mm -hmm. and start buying our blocks back? So I'm glad you brought that up. Today. We, we didn't even talk about that beforehand. <laughs> so right now, I just did it. My latest podcast um, uh, is on Opportunity Zones. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the Real Estate Life of Kevin Riles the podcast, uh, a little cross promotion right there. Indeed. Yeah. Can, yeah. They, can they find it from your website? They can. They, they go to KevinRiles.com. Kevin okay, Riles. Riles. Yeah, okay. KevinRiles.com. Um, uh, and so, um, my latest one is on opportunity zones and opportunity zones are a method of economic development where you can basically invest in a fund that invest in certain areas, uh, that have been designated as opportunity zones. And those areas are mostly brown and black neighborhoods and rural areas. Mm. Uh, and that is an excellent opportunity right now. This came as the tax act of 2017, okay. where people can, can, uh, pool their funds together and basically buy the block. Hmm. Uh, in fact, my plan actually uh, in, in the works now is to create a fund uh, called Buy the Block Fund. Uh, nice. and, 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 and I'm doing a project, the duplex that you may have seen me posting about uh, on Facebook is in a opportunity zone. So hmm. that's a small, small example. So is this kind of like a read? It, 
It can be. It has real tendencies. Yeah, yeah, it has a, a real estate investment trust tendencies, um, um, but it defers your capital gains tax um, to to it can defer your tech capital gains tax to pretty much zero. Hmm. Uh, so um, especially if you sell, if you sold stock and have some cash, or if you sold something, uh, have some cash, you can defer the, the thing. But I say all that to say. To answer your question, yes, I wish we did have more. And I've had I've represented doctor groups where they go in and buy yeah. different practices yeah. and they'll buy a building and each of them has a suite in the building. Shout out to Eric Tate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, so um, and I just represented a, another uh, uh, psychiatrist, African-American psychiatrist mm. uh, who's president, uh, former president of the local African-American psychiatry uh, association here. Uh, he's just bought into a building yeah. uh, uh, with different doctors. So, but you can do that. Yeah. You don't have to necessarily be a tenant, but right. I wish we did that more. Yeah, that yeah. would be great. So like, what if we went and bought a strip center that let's say had five um, different spaces mm -hmm. and each of us put our businesses in there and now we're owning a business and an asset. Now I do recommend that you do get good contracts in place. Yeah. Paperwork, <laughs> friendship is one thing, paperwork is real. <laughs> I think you know a good real estate return. Uh, I do, I do, Natasha Gransberry. The, the Gransberry, Gransberry. Yeah, the yes. Gransberry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully she's watching out Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. she's probably watching football right now. Right, <laughs> I'm getting ready for the season. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. So we talked about um, investing in real estate, You know, compared to the stock market and things like that. What's a good average rate of return you can expect on investments in um, ballpark? That's a hard question to answer because it depends on the type of, of uh, real estate. So in commercial real estate, we talk about things. Uh, a, a a quick measure of return is, is something called a cap rate. Cap rate. Okay. Yeah, capitalization rate. Uh, and the, the definition of that, without getting too professor, you know, I teach, yeah. so uh, is um, uh, basically is the measure of income to the to the value of the property. So yeah. the sales price of the property divided by the net operating, uh, I'm sorry, the net operating income divided by the sales price of the property. Yeah. So what that tells you is if I was to buy this cash, what yeah. basic return I would get. Yeah. Uh, and so right now, for instance, in multifamily, cap rates are depressed. In other words, they're low, which is great for the sellers because that means okay. the property is selling high. Okay. But for buyers right now, um, it's a little tight. Yeah. Um, whereas retail, um, you know, they're a little higher. So for instance, in commercial real estate, that cap is dependent upon the type of property, hmm. the area it's in, uh, things of that nature. So a lot you, of variables. there's a lot of variables. So I tell people that right now, if you can find an apartment complex that has an eight cap, hmm. you know, jump on, jump on it. it. Whereas three years ago, that number would have been 10. So prices have gone up so much that they've squeezed the caps down. If it's retail, um, you know, saying kind of seven to, to nine. If you find anything in a double digit cap, then it's worth taking a look at. Wow. Hope you all looking at that. So the economy's doing well yeah. and stuff is priced high. Some yeah. people think it's priced at a bubblish standpoint. Hmm. So some people are standing on the, 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 you know, the corner waiting for things to kind of yeah. come down a little yeah. bit. Okay. Gotcha. We got a question from the audience. Um, sure. I think this goes back to the um, Opportunity Zones question. Um, Ms. Tanya Prince, is the, is this data published anywhere? Where do you access Opportunity Zone maps? Are there public meetings? So I'm glad you asked that, Tanya, because <laughs> if you go to KevinRiles.com uh, and <laughs> click on um, the, TF, uh, the Real Estate of Life podcast, I actually put the links uh, to uh, both of those questions in, in the uh, podcast notes of that particular Opportunity Zone podcast. Um, I have a frequent, I have a link to the IRS frequently asked questions about Opportunity Zones. And then I have a link to the uh, map that is provided by the federal government that I, uh, that identifies in Houston, since we're sitting in Houston, mm -hmm. um, most of the Opportunity Zones are located kind of in and around downtown, down 288 South Park, Sunnyside area. And then there are quite a few that are um, along the 290 uh, corridor going up into Waller County and things of that nature, okay. just as a general sense. Excellent. Excellent. Up, and a couple out there, one uh, out there is uh, in A-Leaf. Shout out to Tiffany Thomas. Uh, <laughs> Swat. <laughs> uh, uh, A-Leaf as well. Uh, so there's one uh, that's in her district as well. Okay. Well, thank you for that question, Tanya. Um, back to the investment side, though. Google told me that an average rate of return could be around 9.5% to 10%. Would you say that's fair? The only reason I'm hesitant in, in saying yes, that is, is it really honestly depends. Uh, and so let me let me answer it in this way. Okay. I think you should have a goal as to what rate of turn you want. That's fair. 
right? Okay. And so, yes, if I was to invest in real estate, I would be wanting a 10% minimum return. Gotcha. Right. Gotcha. So gotcha. I would answer that question in that way. Okay. But, but there are investors. I just sold a, a apartment complex, $1.6 million. Yeah. Um, that investor bought that apartment complex, not because they wanted a 10% return because the return was around 6%, mm. but they needed, um, they wanted something to have free cash flow because they were investing for other reasons other than return. Mm, right? Gotcha. Not everybody who invests for a return, believe it or not. Some people there's, invest there's, for tax reasons. There's, there's levels to this stuff. Yeah, it's levels. Yeah, yeah. It's levels. Yeah, that's, yeah. Beyonce's sister, she talked about levels. Yeah. yeah. Like levels when Cranes it comes, in the air. comes yeah. to eagles, you know, like Eisenhauer eagles were better. Oh, here we go. Eagles. You don't want to I'm shut, just, I'm about to shut this podcast shut down. down. <laughs> He goes to the dome. Yeah. I'll, yeah, exactly. So, who came up with it? Okay. okay. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So, we talked about, you mentioned it, um, there's different types of real estate. So, um, you have segments in commercial real estate mm -hmm. versus, you know, real residential. You have industrial, office, retail, and hospitality. Yes. For yes. the most part, land. Well, I would add land to that. Land to that. Um, okay. uh, as well. Um, and there are sub segments. Absolutely. In those areas as well, Absolutely. but those are the, those are the basics. Yes. What would you say out of those four, the top ones or the top two to bring? For investment, investing. for yes. investing, multifamily definitely, okay. uh, and retail would be second. Hmm. Um, but what I will tell you right now is some of the best investments I've seen lately and kind of seen over my career are industrial. Industrial, really? Yeah, but people don't think it's sexy, so they don't come out. And there, those deals are a little bit bigger. But yeah. if you think about industrial. Um, people to store everything from these microphones to uh, mm, what we eat. Usually it. if you get an industrial tenant, they're there. Like they're not going anywhere. Right. Uh, and so they're like ticks. Uh, and so if you can get, I'm serious, they are. Uh, so if you can get a good tenant, <laughs> yeah. then the turnover in industrial is just not as much as it is in those other areas. And they're triple net leasing, the triple net leases. And so therefore, once the tenant is in there and you got them situated, Give me my check. Oh, my air conditioner not working. Oh, I'm sorry. Give me my check. You know, it's <laughs> That's kind of, exactly my it's like Debo. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, they just like give me my check. So, triple net investing in general, yeah. even though I, you know, I have especially in multifamily, mm -hmm. is highly appealing to me because once the tenant is in place, you are not responsible for what goes in mm -hmm. uh, on inside there. Um, wow. Yeah. So you're you're maintaining the outside. If yeah. it's a retail center, you know, you might have someone cleaning the windows and you know. Yeah. You know, make it, you know, I would, if I was a, a, a triple net landlord, I would want to make it a nice space. Right, right, right. But what if your toilet is leaking on the inside? That's on you. Yeah, what you going to do? Yeah. yeah. Call Tyrone. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so um, I've also heard that a good thing to invest in is um, storage houses, like, you know, mm -hmm. storage, those, storage yeah. centers. Yeah, they're great investments. I will tell you that I've talked about cap rates. Um, okay. Uh, they do not give you that eight to ten percent return unless you build them from scratch, um, uh, because they people the demand for them is so great that they've driven it's basic supply and demand. Mm -hmm. The supply is low, the demand uh, is high, and so uh, they've uh, gone up in price. But with that being said, think about it: you're leasing, you don't have any toilets, you don't have any really electricity. You know, you're leasing uh, space. It is some of the best. Uh, best. The other good investment. Uh, is um, mobile home parks. Mobile home parks. Because all you leasing is land. You know, gotcha. you don't have nothing to do with uh, uh, with the the actual RV or, or or mobile home. One of the most profitable investments I've ever sold. I sold a 172 slot mobile home park uh, in Southwest Houston, and that guy is probably in the 30 percent return, uh, you know, mechanism. Because at the end of the day, all you're leasing is the the lot. Yeah. That's the owner. Yeah. They're responsible for their mobile home. Everything else, it's, it's amazing. You need have to get grass cut, D. Yeah, yeah. I mean, depending <laughs> on the type of park you, yeah, you're right. But yeah. but even if you do, yeah. I mean, and it's straight cash only. You know, yeah, wow. yeah. Most of those are straight cash yeah. type. Yeah. You know, tax benefits. Yes, <laughs> or not. Yeah, exactly. Or not. exactly. <laughs> right. uh, man, so what do you recommend if someone wants to get started in investing in real estate as a business owner? What are the first three things they should do? Um, they should just like if they were buying a, a, a property, a home, um, get with a lender. Okay. Here's my spill on lenders. Uh, and I hope I don't offend any, anyone that works for a larger lender, but I'm not a huge fan of the larger lenders and they shall remain nameless. But you know them. Uh, I believe that uh, especially small business owners should have a few community banks mm. uh, that they okay. deal with on a consistent basis. Uh, so community banks are typically your smaller 
banks that do what I call old school uh, underwriting, where it's, it's two or three guys in a room or ladies in a room. And they're, you know, not only do you financially qualify, but what do I think about Tristan? And, and well, I'm willing to, uh, uh, and you develop a relationship with them. The duplex that I'm building now um, is being financed through a community bank. Hmm. Uh, and I, I wouldn't have gotten that level of financing how they did it with a, a larger bank. Gotcha. Um, so relationships matter. Relationships, they matter. And you need that relationship way before, you would like that relationship way before you actually need it. Absolutely. You know, as far as in terms of uh, that. So that means establishing not only a personal relationship, but establishing accounts, letting them see your account grow, that type of stuff that you think means something at a larger bank. Mm. But they have so many accounts. It's, yeah. it's, if you know, you're just literally an example number. that I always use is if, if for those that, that are if you see this I'm making a box uh, and larger banks tend to underwrite their loans right in the middle of that box. Mm. If it doesn't, if it's yeah. not in the middle of this box, we're right. not going to lend on it. Whereas community banks, in my experience, can go up against the edges of that box and say, oh, mm. yeah, you don't meet this. But if you do this or if we do it this way, it's a lot more flexibility. It's a more, more flexibility. So that is huge to me. Um, the other thing I would say is start saving money. That business savings uh, is, is important. Um, and then going to the personal side, folks, you got to do your taxes. Because they're going to ask for the last two to three years of your taxes. So yes. you, you got to do your taxes. And if you think I'm going to buy something in the next three years, you got to do your taxes in such a way or talk to your CPA in such a way that you show income. Because I, I didn't even have to say, he already started laughing because he knows as a business owner, we try to, if I can write off my fingers, I'm yeah. writing them off. Right? I'm trying to show as low as income so I don't want to pay taxes, but yeah. you're going to have to pay some taxes to show that incomes to show that you can service that. You have to give Uncle Sam a little bit, a little money. bit of money. We'll start playing. People don't upside. know that. And they'll contact me like, oh, yeah, but no, I really make more than this is what this is showing. Mm -hmm. That's another reason a community bank is important because they might sit down with you and say, oh, OK, yeah. I see yeah. what you're saying versus the big bank is like, no, your yeah. your your income doesn't show that. Yeah. So we got a question. Uh, Miss Brandy Sams uh, wants to Brandy. know what are the best lenders to use? <laughs> um, uh, since they're not sponsoring your, uh, <laughs> they can cut the check if they like. <laughs> um, I mean, again, community banks. If you Google community banks in your area, you can come up with them. Uh, in Houston, you know, some of the smaller banks I could name. Um, you know, Citibank is who I have a personal relationship with. Uh, and that's who did uh, Wayland Themer, and I've done a podcast with him before. Uh, did my deal uh, over, in, but he's also done a lot of my clients' deals. Uh, you know, this is not a community bank, but they act as though BBNT. Uh, hmm. I think is a good bank uh, to um, to uh, uh, consider. Um, and then you have Bank Corp South, who just came to market, and I think Bank Corp South, uh, which is out of kind of East Coast. I went to college in Atlanta, so um, if you, Bank Corp South. Is, a, is being a little aggressive now because they're new to market, kind of like bb &T yeah, was. Uh, and so, uh, and then, you know, there's the independence banks, the spirit banks of Texas, all of them have their kind of nuances, but at least by naming those, you kind of see the size bank I'm talking gotcha, about. Gotcha, gotcha. Not the big marquee ones that's right. on every corner. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. All right, so I think there was one more thing, the third thing you want to recommend um, for people who are looking to get into commercial investments. Um, do you, does the do your taxes do your uh, taxes, part, do, part, your taxes. Yeah, do your taxes and and get with well as a part of that um, find a CPA yes um, self prepared yeah. business banks don't like self prepared tax returns nah just got to get out uh -oh. of QuickBooks <laughs> yeah 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 or if you use QuickBooks yeah. your 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 CPA needs to be embedded with you yeah. uh, to do that but either they either like tax preparers mm -hmm. or an actual CPA yeah. and some of us don't want to pay the money for whatever reason, to have a, a CPA handle that. But if you're going to find a CPA, and this is Kevin's uh, comment, find a CPA that is equally yoked with you um, as it pertains to business. That's not just going to do your taxes, right. but, but also give you um, recommendations as to what your financial goals are. Absolutely. Because there are CPAs out there that may be great, but all they're going to do is take the data you gave them, yeah put it in their algorithm and shoot out your tax returns and not tell you, hey, if you had done this or next year, you need to do that. Right. Uh, and so I'm really big on on making sure that you're equally yoked mm -hmm. with your CPA. So me, you should interview CPAs just like you interview an employee for your company. So that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. So, you know, like we say almost every episode, make sure you have a team and you know, get you a good attorney. I call it PBOD. 
PPOD? Uh, P uh, personal Board of Directors. Oh, there we go. PBOD, get you yeah. a Personal Board of Directors. So who would you recommend? They got CPA. CPA, an attorney. Um, and by, by the way, folks, I say CPA and attorney. These are all professional services. I'm in the professional services uh, business. Um, um, you have to pay for it for knowledge. Absolutely. And we don't like to do that. Uh, <laughs> and so therefore, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, don't give me on that soapbox, but... <laughs> Um, you have to pay for it. Uh, yes. You have to pay for it. So CPA, an attorney, I think you need a business advisor. And that doesn't have to be someone that's a formal business advisor. It just could be someone that you seek out that you know you admire and say, hey, I'm thinking about this. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I really do think that that's uh, important. So those three people, and you can have other folks on there, but those are the three key yeah. folks. Absolutely. And a commercial real estate broker. Commercial real estate. And a good marketer. Yeah. <laughs> So that's five right there. Good, good marketing advertising five. specialist. Yeah, <laughs> oh, man. So I, I saw on your uh, next podcast you have coming up at KevinRiles.com, mm -hmm. um, you're going to be talking about how to find real estate investment deals on MLS. Right. Well, actually, I, it's out there now. It's already okay. been published. It's already out there. Okay. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, my residential background, and I still am a member of the MLS, uh, and I still find deals on the MLS. A lot of people will go to these seminars and say, oh, you can't find deals on the MLS. You know, yeah. it's only this secret way or this, that, and the other. And I'm on there all the time and I find stuff, you know, that if I was investing in that type of um, uh, product, I, you know, that are at least opportunities, or, I think. So, uh, yeah, if they want to check that out, they can go to, to KevinRiles.com. But um, there you can find still find deals on MLS. Hmm. OK, so but there's a saying in, in real estate investing that MLS is where deals go to die because um, mm -hmm. you can't find them. And I, I disagree with that. OK, so there's money out there on the MLS. Tell yeah. them what MLS means. Multiple listing services. So in Houston, that's H-A-R.com. Mm. Um, and that's the source data. H-A-R.com feeds Zillow, feeds all these other sites. So the source data, the most up-to-date data is H-A-R.com. Mm. Gotcha. Shout out to H-A-R.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Good. Got it. Good. Yeah, all, the time. all right. All right. So um, we're wrapping up here. Tell everyone where they can find us. You got two websites. You want them to go to KevinRiles.com? Yeah. So um, for my commercial um if you want to see my podcast, the best is KevinRiles.com. Kevin Riles, and, and honestly, my KevinRilesCommercial.com sends you to the podcast as well. Um, but yeah, for commercial real estate services, questions that you may have, KevinRilesCommercial.com. Uh, KevinRilesCommercial.com. Uh, and you'll find contact information about myself. You'll also find uh, the commercial listings that I have. Uh, right now, uh, I have quite a few industrial listings. Speaking of industrial, uh, one of the silos, of my other silos of the, my business is I list and sell properties for uh, Chapter 7 bankruptcy trustees. Mm. So I have four trustees that I list property for. When companies file bankruptcy, they have to sell their property. They contact me to sell it. So um, I have about four listings out there right now from that contract that I, uh, mm. that I have. Um, and so, yeah, if you're looking, my specialty is investment brokerage. If you're looking to invest in uh, stuff that produces income. Um, uh, my other specialty is what I call single tenant commercial real estate. If you're a, a business owner, doctor, physician, uh, or any type of business owner looking to either build or uh, purchase uh, a single tenant building for your practice. Uh, and then the other specialty is, is tenant representation for it, specifically for retail and industrial. I do a little bit of office uh, but I do a lot of retail uh, and industrial tenant rep. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I'll check them out. KevinRilesCommercial.com. Um, commercial investing is really one of the quickest ways, or not quickest, but mm -hmm. biggest ways to build wealth uh, for your generations to come. We look at Jay-Z and say, oh, we make, he has a million dollars net worth. But I'm sure, a lot of that has something to do with Oh, it does. He talks estate. about it. Yeah. Uh, in his, yeah absolutely. You know, so that's how you can um, level up. Um, in regards to your finances and things like that. So uh, we appreciate Kevin for coming on. Now I have to Thank you. always be brand and plug myself. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have my ads university course, or if you're learning how to use, want to learn how to use Facebook ads, go to um, bit.ly ads you July. Um, that's going to be July 20th here in Houston. Um, if you're looking for more resources like this, previous episodes and just tips and tricks on how to level up your revenue, go to my free Facebook group. Um, go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the revenue clinic, as you see in the link below. And if you need any help with your marketing, you can uh, schedule a 15 minute consultation with me. Discoverycall.gr8.com. Discoverycall.gr8.com. So we thank you all for tuning in. Be sure to tune in next week, Thursday at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. As always, I'm Tristan Sutton, your host and your marketing strategist. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all. Thank Appreciate you it, man. Thank you. Y'all have a good one. God bless.